last year. Um, as you heard from the introduction, most of my experience is in the arts and culture sector in museums, but um, I also have worked with a couple of general charitable organizations and nonprofits through work with an agency over the summer. And I'm always open to um, expanding my breadth of experience. So um, you all may have more knowledge of um, nonprofit uh, organizations and things like that, but I did my best to tailor this presentation to more general, less arts oriented um, things. Although I will speak to a couple examples in the arts that I um, know pretty intimately. So um, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and get this uh, visual aid up here. So let me just, here we go, here we go. And it should, there we go. So this, um, today's talk is the state of social media in 2021 and what to do after a year full of change. Um, I'm going to begin briefly with a little overview on social media in general, what the current numbers are and the platforms that are popular right now. And then I'll go into um, the impacts of COVID-19 on nonprofits and also the social justice and Black Lives Matter issues that we all experienced um, heavily in this last year and how they apply to nonprofits as well. And then we'll wrap up with sort of how um, nonprofits can respond to these changes. So why social media? <laughs> social media is um, a huge communications tool now. Uh, it's been around for about a decade and it's um, estimated to have about over 4 billion active users worldwide. 70% of the US population uses at least one social media platform. And um, to that end, social media is no longer a novelty. It's not going away. It's here to stay. And it's the most powerful media in the history of humanity. It's where we communicate now. So it's not to be taken lightly. It's not something that um, you really want to entrust an intern with representing your brand um, or your nonprofit organization. Um, of course, interns are extremely valuable and helpful in contributing, and especially if they're younger millennials that have a lot of technical knowledge. Um, but you really want to take a strategic approach to your social media. And um, it is a serious matter. And we'll find out um, through an example later on how serious it can be um, when representing your organization. So um, next are kind of the top four platforms in my mind. And um, in terms of users, actually, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter some demographics and statistics on each of those platforms. Um, as you can see, Facebook is the most used platform currently with 2.5 billion monthly active users. That's not including dormant profiles and things that are not um, actually using the platform. And then next up is Instagram with 1 billion monthly active users. Um, and then Twitter and LinkedIn are around 300 million users per month. Um, I group these four together because, of course, Facebook and Instagram have the, the highest number of users. And then for our purposes in the nonprofit um, and cultural sectors, LinkedIn and Twitter tend to be sort of the more kind of serious or business oriented platforms where conversations are happening amongst your audiences, your peers. Um, potential donors, things like that. So I um, encourage usage of these four platforms first before experimenting with others. But there are many others and some of the ones that are kind of emerging and most popular right now are TikTok. Snapchat is kind of on the downturn, but still has a pretty significant number of monthly active users. And um, the age demographic you'll note there is skewing super young, um, far younger than all the other platforms. So if you have um, an, uh, a goal to reach a younger audience, Snapchat is still a place to um, experiment. Um, but as you can see, these eight platforms definitely have uh, a lot of power and potential to reach um, wide audiences and various age demographics. One thing that was surprising to me when I was doing research for this was that TikTok, um, the largest sector of, um, of users on TikTok is 
45 plus. So 29% of TikTok users are actually 45 years old and older. And it actually is pretty even across the age demographics from 18 to 45 plus. So, um, you know, with 800 million active users, that includes, you know, overseas over across, out, uh, around the world. And we know it's quite popular in China. Um, but TikTok can be a useful platform if um, you're open to experimenting with like video and short form content. Um, again, LinkedIn, Twitter, and especially Facebook and Instagram are really the top four that I would recommend starting out with. And um, all of those also require creativity and um, a strategic messaging strategy for you know, determining what you want to say and how you want to say it and providing high quality um, imagery and content to your audiences. You know, you want to look polished, you want to look professional, and you want to represent your brand in a way that um, really speaks to its mission. But um, we're going to shift gears a little bit and uh, move into the impacts of COVID-19 on nonprofits in particular. So, um, you know, because of COVID-19, we saw a major shutdown um, across the world and in the United States. It's been extended for many, many months now, as we all know, and a lot of things have shifted to virtual. Um, when I was looking into how severe it uh, affected nonprofit organizations, um, it was pretty dire. It was pretty clear that um, philanthropy took a hit. Um, you know, a lot of organizations struggled with getting online, you know, moving their uh, workflows and internal teams online to work remotely, and then also to reach to their communities and support them. So um, here is some data I was able to acquire. <laughs> um, and I, I, I should say that Jenna Lynn is going to provide this deck for you as a resource after the fact, so no need to take screenshots right now. And there will be a references slide with links to these uh, data points and further information and context around what I'm speaking to. So um, here is sort of a breakdown of one um, survey that found 83% of organizations experienced a reduction in revenue, whether that's from programming, or philanthropic donations, um, they, they have experienced some kind of reduction in revenue. Um, and somewhere else I read like 93% of all nonprofits that were surveyed in, in another survey reported that COVID-19 had a negative impact on their operations. Um, so, following that 93% reporting, this is the survey that found that. Um, here are some of the challenges that those nonprofits expect to face in um, 2021. And, um, oh, Jenna Lynn, did you want to put up the poll? I think. <laughs> yes, I would love to. <laughs> but we, can, we can definitely have that running in the background right now. Um, we were meant to uh, ask you all what you use personally and what your nonprofit uses on social media just to see what your peers are doing and uh, get a feel for the room. So feel free to answer the poll that just popped up now and then we'll share with you the results when, when enough answers are in. Um, but I gotta get that out of the way so I can speak to this next slide. So, um, these are a number of challenges that were reported for um, as a response to COVID-19. And um, as you can see, one of the highest um, or the highest was contributions reduced. So I know um, from this data that, and from anecdotal data that um, nonprofits are struggling with their philanthropy and their um, donor base, you know, reduced um, expendable income and issues like that. So, um, and then various other um, challenges that people reported. Um, here are a couple museum specific quotes, but they can be applied across um, all nonprofits in general. 
non-digital departments were thrust into depending on a digital team to connect their work with others. And if you don't have a digital team, then you're thrust into depending on whoever is savvy enough to help connect you with others online for in a remote setting. Um, but it's really uh, brought to light the need for um, workflows and the ability to um, be digital for first um, in terms of your internal workflows and then also outward facing communications because, you know, it's less likely that you'll be able to host um, networking events or parties or, you know, a various number of things that you've done in the past due to COVID-19 and also um, social media and digital platforms enable you to be more um, democratic and reach a wider audience. So you're able to, you know, expand from your local borders into uh, a pool of audiences that are connecting from anywhere around the world that might fit your um, nonprofits, um, either uh, populations that you serve or also um, your donor base as well. So um, laying the long-term foundation for digital transformation is, is, has become more important because of COVID-19. Um, so now this is um, another answer to the earlier survey. What uh, innovations did you implement and which were most successful? So um, if, as you read through these bullet points, I, we wanted to welcome a little bit of um, interaction and dialogue uh, for anyone that wants to share what they've experimented with and what was successful for their organization, feel free to turn on your camera and raise your hand to speak out loud. Or if you prefer, you can also put it in the chat. I see Nikki Richardson um, has raised her, their hand, so. Hello. Um, so we, I, I'm the development director for a nonprofit performing arts organization. We support and fundraise for the Performing Arts Center in Thousand Oaks, California. And um, one of our big programs was to provide, um, to bring kids to the theater at no cost. And obviously we haven't been able to do that since March last year. And so we, we threw out a survey uh, last fall to our teachers and administrators and had a huge response within minutes, within 30 minutes of sending the survey out, I had about 6,000 kids committed, you know, that if we provided virtual performances, virtual field trips, if you will, they would be interested. And so we mobilized really quickly after that and partnered with our uh, one of our resident companies and then uh, and basically the, got approval from the board to spend some money on creating a, a virtual uh, field trip program. And so now we, within the first month, I think we did it in December uh, with the Nutcracker, we had 2000 kids viewing the Nutcracker through our virtual platform. And it's been really successful. The teachers love it. We had two National Geographic live speakers and we're just building out an entire program. And the cool thing is that a lot of teachers are saying that they want to continue this even post COVID because some of them are unable to you know, participate um, because of distance and things like that. And so this allows more kids, this allows us to expose more kids to the theater which is a big part of our mission. That's great. Are you, um, were you able to see the demographic information for who was tuning in and where they were coming from? Um, mostly Ventura County uh, for the moment, um, but we did get, we have a lot of kids coming from Santa Paula and um, Oxnard, Port Wyneme. And, you know, Santa Paula is a good 90, a um, little under 90 minutes away for kids. So on a, for a regular field trip, that's a half a day away from school. Mm -hmm. And we know that field trips are going to be one of the last things that come back, you know, even after we're back, it's going to be a while before our kids are able to take a half day out of the classroom because they're going to have to get caught up. Um, and the other part that we were doing also is we partnered with our local school district and are funding them to create weekly arts lessons. So their elementary kids, about 6,000 of them have access to weekly arts lessons and we're getting great feedback on that program as well. Fantastic. And did you reach out to your uh, existing audiences or did you try any new ways of um, reaching out to audiences that you don't already have contact with? 
We started with existing audiences because that was, you know, like I said, we just sent a poll out to a survey out to our, our teachers and educators. Um, but now we actually do use a social media marketing company um, and, and actually started with them in the middle of the pandemic um, to contract with them and give them, you know, not a huge budget, but some amount of money on a, on a monthly basis to help put us out there. So yes, that, that has been also, because we do ask, how did you hear about the program? At the moment, a lot of it is through me or through their teachers or other teachers are sending it to teachers. You know, so we're hoping that that network grows um, and it's free and it's available to families. It's not just for the schools, it's available for, for community members to take advantage just on an individual basis as well. That's great. Great to hear success stories. I think there's one in the chat at All It Takes, we created a trusted space um, which is a free curriculum and 45 minute film for educators, schools and communities. Thanks to donations of time and talent of key education leaders in California. So bravo, Justine. Um, and then at Harbor House, they shifted their services to frontline and essential services. Um, fabulous. That's, that's really um, important and wonderful to hear that um, you're able to help um, directly um, related to pandemic issues and things like that. Um, is there anybody else that wants to share their innovations and changes that you've made in your organization or shall we continue? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. This is Adrienne uh, Snyder at the Riverside Area Rape Crisis Center. And um, we adapted uh, our digital uh, realm, our programming and um, we were successful at doing that as well. Um, we came into, uh, I came into the agency as a new executive director, and I don't believe we really understood how important technology um, was to the success of uh, programs in such a changing world and, and with many changing dynamics. So uh, we did quite a bit of uh, upgrades and technology in our organization. And when the pandemic hit, um, we were actually really prepared uh, to move to a virtual platform and it has worked well and it has grown with us. We just need a development director and I thought I'd put that plug in there. So thanks for allowing me to share. I'm muted. Um, I was saying all, always good to share opportunities. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your, um, your experience. It looks like Susan Soy opened a new online bookshop with our libraries closed and daily book sale revenue unavailable to us. So um, Susan, do you want to share what organization you're with? Either in the chat or out loud. <laughs> Yes, I'm with the Friends of the Thousand Oaks Library, and our so much of our revenue has come from daily book sales inside the two libraries here in Thousand Oaks. Um, but with the libraries closed, that revenue stream just came to a halt. So we opened um, a new um, shop, ftol.org bookshop, and uh, we're able to bring some revenues in. And of course, those revenues support the local library. So uh, we're very happy that we took the time and, and great effort to do that. Wonderful. That is a great pivot and a, and a nice way to translate something that's traditionally in person to an online format. Mm -hmm. We also are exploring alternative ways uh, to bring more funds to the nonprofit. Uh, because uh, we realized that, that that one revenue stream was um, not a steady footing for our organization to continue to meet our mission of supporting the library. So uh, we're beginning to use social media to uh, ask for more contributions and explain to people what those contributions do in the community. Great. It's a great use of social media. A challenge, but a great use. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nikki Richardson says they started presenting drive-in movies and concerts in the parking lot. Um, TO Arts Roadshow, averaging about 50 cars or 200 plus people per show, which is, that's also really cool. Uh, 
looks like Jenny Lynn says at CNL, we adapted our programs to be entirely on Zoom, like this one. Woohoo! Grown their reach and audience across Southern California. That's excellent. Anybody else before we move on? All right. So. In 2021, we'll see a lot more experimentation with virtual platforms for talks, panel discussions, performances, and conferences. Um, Zoom is a great tool to utilize, but there are others out there. Um, I attended a museum conference back in November called Museum Computer Network, which was all about museum technology from the start. Um, but this year, for the first time ever in more than 50 years, it has gone virtual and they used several different um, tools to make it a virtual experience, not just um, for panel discussions, but also for social experiences as well. So Zoom was the primary platform for presentations. And then they also had a Slack account for participants to Slack each other, even just pictures and gifts for each other. One of the most uh, popular Slack channels was um, share your pets. <laughs> And so everybody shared photos of their pets, which was really fun. And um, another tool that they use that I found really interesting was called social spatial chat, which um, was an interesting tool where you have a video, a little bubble of yourself as on video, and um, you go into a space like a room and you see other bubbles of other people and the closer you move to them, the louder they get. And so if you group together with a group of uh, bubbles, you can have a discussion amongst multiple people. And then in the other part of, part of the space, you can see where other groups are convening. So it's kind of cool to be able to, so to speak, walk around a room in a virtual space. Um, so I thought that was a really useful and innovative um, tool to, to try with a social um, environment. So it's called spatial chat, if you're interested in that. Um, and then another quote here is not about getting COVID-19 behind us. It's about learning everything we can and taking the knowledge to move beyond it. And this will probably stay with us for a little bit longer um, before everyone can be vaccinated and herd immunity can be achieved. And you never know what else can pop up in the future, whether it's another virus or pandemic or, you know, something unimaginable. So I think um, virtual spaces and tools are only going to become more valuable and important, not to discount in-person experiences either when we can return to that. But, um, you know, the technology that we have today really um, is moving more towards a more genuine um, experience for most um, participants. So that's really cool. Um, rounding out this part of the presentation in terms of COVID, um, five things that nonprofits can do in particular are, um, you know, talking to your donors. You can still ask, you can still communicate with them and, um, you know, uh, invite their, um, their input onto the organization, especially their financial input, um, which is also leads into the next point, don't stop fundraising. Um, especially if you're hard hit by the virus or the pandemic, you can have appeals and online campaigns um, to stay relevant and continue to receive at least a portion of what you were getting um, before in the before times. Um, take care of yourself. That's another big one because we're all experiencing after a whole year of moving into a remote space for the most part, we're all experiencing fatigue around zoom and being on camera and having to share our our living space or personal space in a lot of um, cases with our workspaces and so um, I think that's a big one is is actually take care of yourself and your staff internally and make sure that um, people are are weathering this storm um, get organized and look ahead so um, one of you spoke to uh, coming on board and realizing you had a lot of work to do on the digital side and getting to work right away, which then prepared you to move into the digital sphere further during COVID, which that is, um, that's a huge, um, hugely important task, you know, to, to find out what your weaknesses are and your areas for improvement and 
start making strides towards, um, you know, getting up to speed with those since, um, you know, some of these things take time and, and budget and finances. So, you know, it, it, it is, um, it's a priority. It, it should be a priority to be as digital, uh, be as in the digital sphere as you can, um, technologically and um, messaging wise, communications wise. So um, keep delivering on your mission is the last point. And that definitely um, should be the first one or that one of the most important ones that you all um, already know that it's important that your um, organizations have important work to do and uh, there should be a way to continue that work, whether it's um, in real life physically or um, online virtually. Um, my cousin works for a nonprofit in the Bay Area that um, works with uh, foster children and um, families that need support um, and they had a lot of fundraising to do and a lot of pivoting to do and um, grant writing and things like that. And so um, I think if nothing else, the pandemic really put a lot of more stress on all of us in that, in that area. And, um, you know, the importance of the mission still shines through even with the challenges. So, um, you know, finding ways that you can do what you can with what you got and develop um, new strategies and techniques to, um, to uh, serve that mission as closely as possible or even better um, to where it was. So next is um, nonprofits on social justice. And I guess before we move on to this second topic, does anyone have any um, feedback to share or any thoughts on um, your experiences? I see there's a little bit more in the chat, which I'll glance over here real quickly but please raise your hand or unmute yourself and speak up if you have anything to share. No? We've got a lot of text sharing. So downtown Oxford, Teatro de las Americas, excuse my accent, is trying to find ways to engage audiences in virtual performances, different theater experience. Yes, absolutely. Um, Another great resource is your colleagues and peers at other organizations to leverage what they've done, um, hear about their successes. So I'm glad we're a part of this conversation. And I hope if um, we're not dialoguing um, verbally here, you can you know, go offline and reach out to your other um, contacts that might support you in your experiences of developing these new strategies. Um, Orgs that Elena is involved with, Planned Parenthood Central Coast Action Fund, took fundraisers online and increased the diversity of supporter base significantly with geographic income level, et cetera. Um, and as a regional organization, that was a big win. Great. That's awesome to hear. That's the power of uh, the virtual sphere and moving things digital, um, you know, by force, but also intentionally in order to diversify is really um, a great uh, outcome. So uh, pro bono leadership at leading from within coaching for nonprofit leaders and emerging leaders via zoom. Very wonderful. That's, I'm sure very valuable for those of you that are experiencing challenges. Um, three hour class time for the townies Inc for in person storytelling workshops was near impossible. So they pivoted to one hour workshops at a month to month rate. Um, more flexibility. And they offered more virtual classes and a number of virtual performances. One unexpected benefit was increased accessibility geographically, also for folks who would normally have difficulty getting to the physical studio. Awesome. There are also accessibility tools that can be employed for Zoom and other um, video and uh, verbal or audio um, uh, programs like, you know, caption services or ASL mm -hmm. translation and stuff like that. So it's also something to think about when you're talking about pivoting. Lots more comments. I'm not going to read through them all because it's getting to be a lot and I want to be careful of our time, but um, thank you for sharing everyone that has and please continue. Um, if anyone wants to share again, please speak up now or I'll move on. 
All right. All right, so the role of nonprofits in social justice. Um, not new, Black Lives Matter has been around for several years and social justice issues and racial justice issues have been around since the founding of our country. Um, but in 2020, we saw a real increase in attention to that. And, um, you know, obviously some of the more um, violent uh, or active physical protests were uh, drew more attention to that issue and obviously the crimes and and um, occurrences of injustice were super severe this year and um, you know there definitely needs to be some change occurring in our country um, and around the world in terms of racial justice. Um, so I wanted to start with a quote from MLK because he was one of our um, preeminent leaders in the civil rights movement or the preeminent leader of the civil rights movement. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies when he refuses to stake a, take a stand for that which is true. And, um, you know, silence is violence is one of the quotes that I saw come out of the protests of this past spring and summer. And I think um, a lot of people have spoken to that. Um, let's see here. The next thing I'm going to talk about, I'm actually going to rewind for a second. Okay, so um, there is a call to stand up for what's right, to speak out against injustices, and to be a part of the conversation that is so important in this um, climate. So um, the next thing I'm going to share with you is a case study of a museum that experiences experienced challenges around speaking out for Black Lives Matter um, and sort of kind of unpack what happened in that in that instance and how um, their communications uh, addressed the issues and then responded to criticism um, for their um, their posting strategy or their messaging strategy around it. So I think one thing before I get into that is um, that Black Lives Matter and social justice issues demand of institutions and nonprofit organizations is a real intentional messaging strategy that um, is not just lip service that actually um, speaks to real efforts to combat the issues that they're speaking out against. So. Um, this next example is going to be um, a little bit uh, about what their messaging was and also the response to their messaging and then their response to the responses. So, um, you know, it's not right or wrong and it's a definite challenge for any organization to really get behind um, making the changes that are necessary to, you know, um, back up what they say. but. Um, Obviously, it's not just a one person job and it's not just the, the job of a social media manager or communications director. It's really from the top down um, institutional. And we saw a lot of organizations and museums in particular criticized for speaking out against Black Lives Matter, but having internal structures that were um, problematic and uh, remnants or direct, um, directly related to white supremacists. Um, practices, whether they were blatant or ingrained. So before, uh, without further ado, I'm going to give the example of um, SF MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, uh, started out addressing the Black Lives Matter protests back in May with an image of an artwork by artist Glenn Ligon and a quote that says, why do we need to raise our hands in that symbolic space again and again to be present in this country? And um, a former employee wrote a, a relatively long comment that I'll let you read, um, basically calling it a cop out and saying that in her experience and the experiences of some of her peers, they were um, treated um, poorly by staff internally at the museum. Now, 
that's a valid criticism. That's a, that's a statement that really reacts to what they posted and, and also what they didn't include in their post. And the problem arose when um, SFMOMA deleted that comment. So, and, and muted all comments for that post um, in, in, the, in real time, like within hours of posting and within hours of that comment appearing. So, um, you know, a hollow corporate Black Lives Matter post on their Instagram drew a critical comment from an ex-employee and their deletion of that comment set off a month of escalating drama and critiques of the museum's mostly white executive culture. Um, so not only was it their post and the opinion of that person and many people in their audience that thought it was hollow, um, it was their reaction to that comment in deleting it and pausing all comments and forbidding future dialogue on that post um, at the time. So um, really their, their um, reaction sort of drew even more um, response from their audience. Um, and normally SFMOMA, SFMOMA posts more than once a day, um, but in that time, the first post was on May 30th and they spent over six weeks through the middle of July trying to backpedal and um, address that concern and the concerns of their audiences. And, um, you know, even their subsequent posts drew some criticism. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit further. Um, this is the update to their first initial post. We can do better. This post should have more directly expressed our sadness and outrage as an institution to the ongoing trauma and violence that continues to disproportionately af affect Black lives. So there's an apology here. There's an affirmation that Black lives do matter, that they're committed to doing better. And then a bit of a pivot saying they want uh, their audience to follow community guidelines and not uh, directly um, name individuals in uh, their commentary or criticism of their posts. Now, the argument on the end of the former employee was that all the people that she called out by name were public facing individuals in their communications department listed on their website, et cetera. So, you know, it was sort of a back and forth conversation about what is acceptable in terms of Instagram's community guidelines and the guidelines of um, the organization's social media policy, and then what is um, appropriate response for us at MoMA. So um, the next one was also an another ask to follow community guidelines. This may have been done concurrently with updating the earlier post actually. So um, it's very similar to the message in the former post. And as you can see, they still got a lot of criticism. The first uh, comment that shows up in the screenshot is shut up. So, um, you know, I feel for staff at any institution, especially the person who's in charge of directly managing commentary because uh, you know like I said before it's not just one person and and typically the people involved in uh, developing this communication strategy um, are not particularly empowered with changing the organization <laughs> um, but you know these kind of statements need to come from the top down and need to um, be reflected in their actions as well as their words so um, the next statement that they posted was from Heavy Breathing, which was an organization or an artist collective that <coughs> was involved with the museum. And it was directly criticizing SF MoMA's uh, shortcomings on their previous post. Um, deleting and disabling comments is a silencing act that is complicit with and enables system systemize, systemize violence against black individuals. <laughs> So here they are actually giving voice to a, a criticism from someone that they're actually working with, which is a little bit more of a step in the right direction. Um, they're beginning to pivot towards um, addressing their um, mistake and kind of remedying that. Um, again, still drawing heavy criticism. I don't have the comments linked here, but um, as you can imagine, the dialogue continued to um, to unfold around their subsequent messaging. So um, these are their other, their next two messages, an apology to the staff member from 
the director of the institution and then um, also a, a list of action items of how of demonstrating their commitment to change and I think um, these two items were another step in the direction of uh, not remedying the situation, but yeah, definitely like moving forward and um, sort of making the, uh, addressing their mistakes in the first um, couple of posts and then, you know, taking action going forward. So um, as a comparison, this is a little um, visual of the Oakland Museum of California's um, posts during this time as well. And um, it's a very different organization, very different um, makeup, um, very different audience or somewhat different audience, even though they're geographically um, close. But uh, Oakland Museum took a different approach to addressing Black Lives Matter from the beginning. And um, in addition to a message of solidarity, they actually, these black um, background, white text on black background posts were actually um, action items to share with their community that people can, um, how they can support the movement and how they can participate. Um, and so there are different ways to message support and solidarity and also um, acknowledge institutional shortcomings and problems within the structures. Um, but I think most, um, most everyone agrees that the empty statement um, using a black artist's work without their consent actually sharing just um, the artwork and a quote that wasn't super relevant um, to the matter at hand was definitely um, a problem. So you can see the differences between the communication strategies and um, sort of how the pivot happened with the previous organization with SF MoMA um, apologizing and moving in a direction that really was more um, backed up by um, living those values. So um, in general, nonprofits can and should um, support social justice. And um, here's a quote from the Chronicle of Philanthropy saying, um, many release statements saying Black Lives Matter and that they stand in solidarity with protesters and the shift in their language was huge, but those are still just words. The question going forward from here is what will they do in the days ahead to live into those values? And so this um, really speaks to what's needed in terms of addressing social justice issues and um, what we saw SF MoMA do in the end was to create a list of um, action items that they're they're working towards being better. Um, and here are some other takeaways. Go beyond just a statement of support. Communicate steps your organization plans to take. Um, provide your constituents, especially those of color, with an opportunity for open, honest discussion and feedback. That was one of the big failures of the initial post for SF MoMA because they silenced their critic and they deleted the comment, turned off comments altogether, and act, you know, in, in the moment pretended like they didn't um, have uh, they didn't have a criticism, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't at fault at first, and then they pivoted to apologize. Um, and then further pivoted to um, work on their shortcomings. So again, it's more important than ever to evaluate, continue, and strengthen your DEI work. Um, you want your team members and your constituents to share their ideas without backlash. Again, don't delete a comment. Don't silence your critics. Um, if there is a valid um, argument or criticism against you, in general in social media, whether it's related to social justice or not, um, deleting comments that um, are valid or a different perspective generally are met with even more criticism and more pushback because um, social media is really a place to have a conversation and to um, participate in a dialogue. And if you're you know, broadcasting out without being open for 
um, responses that that is problematic in terms of um, the use of social media. And um, so you really you really want to have a concrete policy in terms of reacting to online criticism, trolls. Um, you know, obviously there are cases for deleting or removing comments that are offensive or directly threatening. But again, um, you do want to make sure that you remain open to uh, different perspectives and, and uh, criticisms that are either valid or, um, you know, express a different uh, opinion than yours. Um, and then lastly, you cannot please everyone. Some will say you're not doing enough and some will say you're doing too much, but at the end of the day, you wanna stay true to your mission committing to real change should take priority. So um, that's a lot. Does anyone have any thoughts on that to share out loud or in the chat right now um, before I continue? I see that there's still more um, conversation happening in the chat, which is great. I'll catch up on that if anybody wants to speak. Anybody? <laughs> um, let's see here. Their values didn't align what was espoused in the post. Yes, that's true. Um, great example, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, it's hard for me because I can't see my future slides. So I'm trying to anticipate what's coming next out of memory. Um, but I think this wraps it up pretty well. Um, nonprofits play a critical role in social change, whether raising financial or moral support giving visibility to marginalized, marginalized communities or organizing activist campaigns, organization with a social focus, make it easier for people to join together and exercise the power of collective voice. So um, many nonprofits and I'm sure some of you have a direct role in social justice. And if you're more on the arts and um, culture side, as you've just seen, there is still a responsibility there. And I'm sure whatever sector you're um, serving is, um, you know, social justice and racial justice is always appropriate to address um, in terms of uh, not just your messaging, but also your organizational structure and your, um, your actions behind combating those major issues in our culture. Um, so there are some things technically that also can be done to serve new communities or underserved populations. Um, I mentioned already ASL and translation services, um, captioning services for accessibility reasons. You know, it's, it's not just race, it's not just um, accessibility, it's a lot of different um, inclusive, um, or it's a lot of different priorities to be a more inclusive organization and be um, as um, accessible as possible to the wider audiences. You know, when we talk about the power of social media, being able to connect with audiences around the world and um, different demographics than your traditional local population, you also want to um, be aware that you can take steps to um, you know, make your content and your organization accessible online um, to a, a wide um, demographic. So here are some ideas and some uh, ways to begin that, um, that work to set yourself up technically to do some of these things and also, um, you know, reaching, you know, actually intentionally um, reaching out to a wider audience. So more black indigenous people of color audiences would engage with our organizations if they feel welcomed, included and aware of what's happening. So yeah, that's that's really the, the meat of it is that um, so social media and digital um, tools enable us to reach that audience, but you also wanna make sure that your communication strategy and your plans include um, include them and welcome them and um, really address the shortcomings that you might experience in your own organization. <coughs> Excuse me. What's going on in the chat? Someone already 
can you speak to what some of those items on the last slide are a little more specifically? What does SEM do? What is cultural affinity targeting? Uh, let me go back to that slide real quick. Uh, so I will share my references again with you. Um, this is specifically from, let's see, ah, Culture Track, which was um, a research project done by an agency called La Placa Cohen. And um, there, there will be more context in that uh, link, but um, search engine marketing, um, which, you know, it's, it's similar to search engine optimization where you can um, intentionally draft your content and your verbiage on your website and your, in your communications to um, be more by multilingual, um, be more accessible. There's also, you know, translation services that Google offers for websites in different language than the user's language. So um, I am not super well versed in search engine marketing, to be honest, but it's something that um, can be um, important and, and helpful in terms of um, translating your content to non-English speakers, I guess. Um, I lost the chat. Come back, chat. What was the other part of that question? Um, um, what is the cultural affinity targeting? Right. So cultural affinity targeting, um, I think that's, yeah, that's speaking to social media advertising. So when you advertise on Facebook and Instagram, it gives you tons of options for um, creating a target audience, whether it's their geographic location and their um, cultural affinities, which are their likes and their, um, their engagement with other, um, other accounts that are, you know, related to culture. Um, so you can, you can actually like, use keywords, you can search for um, similar or um, various differences in like, uh, interests that they're, um, that they, that they uh, that their engagement and interaction on the platform tell, tells us about them. So you can say, you know, um, I want people who are interested in social justice or interested in um, equality, things like that. Um, and, you know, I encourage you to look into the link that I'm gonna provide and also search around for yourself. Cause um, like I said, I'm, I'm, somewhat also still learning with you on this stuff. But um, in terms of social media advertising, I think this point is speaking primarily to um, using keywords to diversify your audience and target audiences that um, are you know, a broader audience than your traditional um, past audience that you've had in your organic social media, maybe, or even in your past advertising. So I think what they're saying is, don't just advertise to, to the audience that, um, you know, you, that's even local or that you think might engage with your, with your content. You want to broaden that and, and use their search or their advertising tools to um, expand that audience to a more diverse segment. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry if that was stumbly. <laughs> Anybody else have any anything to add? Okay, maybe about there. So this is really the end of my the bulk of the presentation. I have a couple more slides on how you can use social media. Um, I think social media is a great entryway to participate in conversations happening in the digital sphere. Um, you can communicate evolving priorities and promote virtual programming and other online initiatives. Um, and you can also connect with potential donors and supporters, as well as the communities you serve and populations in need of your services. So again, social media, um, the takeaway from the two case studies or the two um, major issues of 2020 is that now that we're all forced into the digital side of things, we can use social media to participate in it and to um, 
really uh, back up and, and um, to address some of these issues and concerns. Um, do, do, do. There's no denying that the pandemic forced us all further into this world. You can tap into the power of social media to stay relevant, engage and build your audience, meet communications goals and more. So um, standing up for social justice can be answered through genuine actionable messaging on your social media accounts and a concerted effort to reach traditionally underrepresented communities online. Um, again, with those three things, um, staying relevant, engaging and building your audience and meeting communications goals. We don't have a lot of time to get into the nuts and bolts of how to do that just yet, but fortunately for you and for everyone else, um, we can. We are going to do a follow-up um, applying 2020's lessons to the 2021 social media strategy. So I'll get into more detail on tools and um, strategies to implement in order to address the, these um, these uh, big issues that we've just talked about. But um, yeah, that's, that's the bulk of my conversation. I would love to open it up to any more direct questions that you might have or dialogue, um, sharing your experiences, successes, challenges, etc. So I'm also going to chat you the contact stuff here. But anybody want to jump in here and discuss? Uh, this is Sherry uh, Grunveld, and I just wanted to add, this is great information. So um, at Harbor House, we've been just down in the trenches, feeding people and housing people and dealing with homelessness and the pandemic. But this is something, social justice has been on my mind and our heart. And, you know, obviously um, poverty affects disproportionately the people of color. So it's just like put this, back on our to-do list. So thank you. Great. You're welcome. Really good information. How do nonprofits take a stand on topics that feel oh. highly politically charged at the moment <laughs> without alienating board members or donors? Good question. Does anybody have any thoughts on that question before I formulate my answer? <laughs> Politically charged um, issues are very um, challenging to navigate, I will say. One of the criticisms that I saw um, directly at SFMOMA and other organizations during this time was that their board and donor base was made up of non people of color, mostly white um, affluent individuals. And of course, the donor base is um, by traditional nature affluent so um i guess you really want to look at um efforts to diversify that your board and your donor base as well um one thing that i want to get into in the next workshop is um decolonizing wealth and talking about how you can do fundraising um, at a smaller more grassroots scale than just um tapping um, the wealthiest and, and your board. You can also use digital marketing and social media efforts to crowdfund and um, bring in um, revenue from just um, a larger audience that maybe it's smaller contributions, but you might be surprised at what you can accomplish. So I think that's one solution. Um, hopefully, engaging with these topics and taking a stand doesn't alien doesn't inherently alienate your board and your donor base um you know even though they may be um homogenous hopefully they also share um your stance and your organization's stance on these issues so i think um that would be you know something to have a conversation internally about is if anybody is disagreeing with your stance? Do you want them to be representative of your organization? Do you want them to be participating? Um, you know, money is nice, but there is a, um, a, a direct consequence of accepting donations from problematic sources. So I think definitely something to address. Um, 
Wow, a lot of a lot of co questions and comments in here. Does anyone want to speak out loud? Um, I feel weird reading all of them. <laughs> Anybody want to jump in? I can read Lily's um, you. <laughs> for you. A big question I have is about a massive drop in engagement that I've noticed on our social media pages across platforms. I know that there have been some big adjustments to the algorithm so as to force companies to pay for ads. Um, how can I organically deal with this issue? So questions centered around algorithms. <laughs> well, thank you for this question. And algorithms are obviously always just a terrible, terrible mystery to all of us. Um, and algorithms are not um, neutral either. So that's another issue that we all combat um, in trying to get our um, content seen. And obviously, like you, you said, Lily, um, forcing companies to pay and advertise on the platforms is part of the reason the alg algorithm uh, operates in such a way. So nonprofits, lowly nonprofits and organizations that don't have huge budgets struggle with competing with the giant corporate um, monoliths that we all see on social media so actively. Um, there are, you know, some ways to optimize your content. You know, you want to always share relevant content to your audiences and um, things that will engage them and resonate with them. So the more likes, comments, and shares you get on your content, the more people are likely to see them and the higher up in the algorithm it's, it's likely to land. Um, you also can um, put in your content direct calls to action to like and comment and share. Um, questions to your audience, you know, things like that, that prompt engagement rather than just um, hoping that people will do so. Um, you know, if it's, if it's a conversation that you want to start, um, prompt them to comment their answers and comment their perspectives and um, really think about your content strategy in terms of how to optimize your engagement and how to get the most engagement um, from your posts organically. Um, even asking them to share content. Um, other ways to amplify your content organically, um, I think there, there would be a little bit of um, budget that needs to be behind it, but um, outside of advertising, you can implement um, giveaways or sweepstakes that offer a prize for commenting and tagging friends in there. Um, you do want to look at the terms and conditions of the platforms for what is allowed and um, um, permissible, but there are ways to run these types of um, engagement strategies that can amplify your content and get more eyes on what you're posting. Um, once your some content goes up in the algorithm, your page tends to get more traction. You know, if you have one thing go viral you'll often um, reap the benefits of that viral post in future subsequent posts for a while. And if you can keep tailoring your content to what your audience is looking for, then your place in the algorithm remains um, higher. Um, and then one last thing that I can think of for organic promotion is um, collaborating with other peer organizations or publications or for-profit companies, anybody that you can think of that would be amenable to a collaboration where you um, repost each other's content, share the content, create content together and share it out, um, mention and tag other accounts, um, all of that will serve to amplify your organic content as well. And obviously, and then there's also, you know, influencer activations that you can employ, um, which, can can be very useful and successful and, and sometimes can be challenging as well. So we can talk further about that. Yay, thanks, Lily. I appreciate the feedback. Jenna Lynn, do you want to keep assisting in some of the QA? I just um, feel like I'm talking at you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um as far as other questions in the chat, there have been discussions about um, fundraising. Um, Susan has a question, isn't it true that smaller contributions do drive revenue in large part, not just big donor dollars, which I realize is a little bit more of a fundraising um, specific question rather than social media. But um, what have you seen as far as maybe you could speak to some really good 
more crowdsourced campaigns on social media and your experiences? Yeah, I mean, I'll get to more examples next time because mm -hmm. I, off the top of my head, cannot think of anything. I'm a little expanded from my brain right now, but um, yes, grassroots. I mean, we've seen the success of crowdfunding um, just anecdotally throughout the last decade or so. Um, crowdfunding is a digital initiative and can be augmented by social media. So um, by nature, yes, it has, it has huge potential and um, can definitely make a significant dent in your fundraising goals. So um, I'm definitely looking forward to sharing more examples with you next time. And um, I think Jenilyn can share that this conversation will be available online as a recording on YouTube. And then next time, I think we can also probably share a recording as well. So if you're not able to make it live, um, those answers will be waiting for you as a recording after the fact. So there's another follow-up question uh, from Lily. Are there any sources that you recommend for further information on upping engagement and fundraising through social posts? You know, I haven't gotten there in my research yet. That's something that I've saved for next time. Um, but, you know, I am a huge proponent of um, finding reputable sources through search. So Googling a lot of different um, publications and um, sources to support my, um, my research. And I encourage you all to do the same. Um, like I said, I will do the work for you for next time. Um, I am going to look for those um, types of tools and resources and examples. Um, but, you know, a good place to start in terms of best practices um, are often the tools that um, social media that provide social media services like Hootsuite or Sprout Social are scheduling tools that um, you know, allow you to organize and schedule your content, but they all have blogs and they all have um, a marketing strategy on their end that um, shares best practices and information about how to utilize the platforms to their, um, to their strengths. So um, a good place to start looking is those, um, those resources. And um, I know also Mashable is a good online um, publication that really um, looks at digital tools and social media in particular for um, those best practices that you can tap into. Yeah. Websites are media sources. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, my, my caveat in terms of doing further research is really, yeah, like um, your, con your, your research is only as good as your sources. So I think that's one thing that just be cognizant when you're doing searches where your information is coming from and who's posting that content and providing that information. So the more reputable um, sources for best practices will be the tools and um, platforms and people that are doing the work and, um, and you know, aware of uh, the strengths of each platform and the different functionality. 11.15, bye Justine. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions from our group? I, if not, I actually have a question for you, Lucy. Okay. All right. Um, something that I feel like has been really top of mind in the last year has been crisis communication. Um, I'd be curious just to hear like your thoughts of like best practices that people could really just keep in mind whenever you are navigating crisis communication on a social media page. Okay. Um, depending on the crisis, I guess, Janelyn, what kind mm -hmm. of crisis are you particularly talking about? Um, I mean, one of the examples that we were given in the chat is that an individual was um, navigating some community critique with some of their stances of uh, being more, trying to be more anti-racist. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think it's very much tied to you know, organizations interest in being showing up more for social justice. So probably crisis communication as it relates to systemic injustices institutionally. And handling criticism. Okay. Yeah. Handling yeah, I criticism. Think, I think it's important to differentiate handling criticism and um, 
you know, even trolling or abuse online versus crisis communications in terms of emergencies or, uh, you know, I think the Getty had a good example of addressing crisis communications in terms of a fire near, near the museum at one point. But um, in terms of handling criticism um, as a crisis communications strategy, uh, one thing that you always want to keep in mind that I've said that I said a, a little bit earlier is um, don't silence dialogue, don't silence the critics, you know, if it's a valid or um, you know, if it's a it's a perspective that somebody has and a differing opinion, um, it's not necessarily wrong to um, enable that person to share their opinion and um, and for dialogue to happen in the commentary on your posts between your followers that are critical of you. Um, if you if you post online, you're open you're opening yourself up to criticism and you're always going to find people that disagree with you, even if you're talking about the most mundane, um, innocuous things. So, um, you know, like a previous example said, you you know, you can't please everyone. But um, I think one of the most important things to not invite further criticism and vitriol from your audiences is do not silence your critics if it's a valid, um, non-threatening, non-violent um, opinion. Um, people should be um, empowered to share their opinions and their differences on your, um, in, in your social media comments. And um, whether you address those or not directly is up to your organization. I've found that a lot of times um, when it's something somewhat, some, somewhat innocuous or if it's somebody really going for um, a genuine post that you feel is you know, shouldn't be criticized or you feel very strongly on your side of the opinion. If somebody has a differing opinion, sometimes the rest of your audience will jump in and defend you. Um, so if you deleted that comment, you wouldn't have the opportunity for other people to comment in, in your support. And um, so sometimes I would say, stay silent and let your audience do the defending. Um, sometimes addressing the comment directly and saying, you know, this is why we feel this way and thank you for your input or um, or just not acknowledging or addressing it at all and just letting it live there as a different opinion than what is posted in your, your message. So um, I think one of the, the biggest, um, the, the biggest takeaways is really try to enable that dialogue to happen and, and don't silence it. Cause again, people can screenshot, people can save things that nothing is um, completely hidden or deleted. You, you can, um, there will be a record of it for people that have criticized you. So um, if it's a valid criticism, like in the case of the SF MoMA employee, um, that was her opinion, that was her experience and um, deleting the comment was absolutely a mistake on the part of the museum and you saw how much it took to remedy the situation and I mean even to this day there are still repercussions so um, yeah I think that's that's one of the key takeaways is um, evaluate and also I guess another huge um, piece of advice that I have in terms of handling online criticism and abuse is to establish a protocol and decide before you get the criticism and before you get the differing opinion, how you're going to respond to various levels of, um, of an argument, whether it's to address them, whether it's to leave it there, whether it's to hide it or delete it, if it is threatening or um, violent, you don't want to leave, you know, you obviously do want to delete things that are um, really abusive or horrible or uh, violent against any population or individuals. Um, so that can be also part of a social media policy or a messaging strategy that you put together before you um, post anything that's racially, politically, socially charged that would invite that kind of criticism. So having a plan in place um, and also knowing the um, chain of command for, you know, how to make those decisions between do I leave it there? Do I delete it? Do I respond to it? Who you contact in your organization to um, to draft that messaging and to approve it and to, you know, make sure that it represents the organization as a whole. And um, in my experience as a social media manager, being 
kind of down the rungs of the organization, I definitely um, felt pressure and responsibility um, to address some of these things. And I didn't feel empowered and like, uh, you know, rightly so, I definitely needed the support of senior staff and higher level staff to support me and help me navigate those issues. So you don't want to leave it to one person in the organization. You don't want to leave it to an intern in particular. Um, it's very important to think about these things ahead of time before you have to address them in real time, because often um, those those conversations take time. And sometimes when things go off on social media, it's really immediate and really rapid fire. So, um, you know, a, a knee jerk response of deleting a comment can have major repercussions. So. I think that's super helpful. I think just like establishing a protocol, particularly because I feel like in nonprofits, uh, you have a lot of hands working on the same social media platform. So having like that protocol that everyone can go to in case there's anything that happens is really smart. Mm -hmm. um, well, if there aren't any other questions, then I am just going to invite you all again uh, to join us for Lucy's upcoming workshop where we'll be able to get a little bit more hands-on deeper into the nitty-gritty of applying these learnings um, to your social media strategy. I'm going to place the link in the chat, chat for more information. Um, this workshop, we are going to have a little bit of a limit on the number of people who are going to be attending, so I encourage you all to sign up fast um, before it fills up. Um, otherwise, as Lucy had shared, I'm going to be following up with the PDF of the slides that you saw today, a link to our YouTube channel, um, which will have this recording, which we encourage you to share with your colleagues, um, as well as an evaluation, which we encourage you all to give your feedback so that we can always be um, keeping up and doing our best to serve you all. So without further ado, I'm just going to invite everyone to is share a sentiment of gratitude to Lucy. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you've put into today and sharing your expertise, walking us through that very, very um, rich case study. Uh, I think like just seeing those examples alone are very, very helpful to know like, oh, okay, we need to, we need to have a plan. <laughs> So thank you everyone for spending your morning with us. Um, until next time, uh, have a wonderful day and thank you all again. I wanna thank you all for joining too and thank you Jenna Lynn, for the opportunity to share. So hopefully I'll see some of you in the next one. Of course. Thank you. Bye everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Lots of thank yous in the chat, Lucy, so. <laughs> Awesome. Have a great day. Bye.